guy who we have Michael Abraham tonight, and uh, he wants to do his own introduction, so we're right going to Michael Abraham. Thank you. Uh, I know some of you guys here. Um, so I uh, was asked to do a demo, and I usually pay in oil, and I usually do my demos in oil. Uh, and I often do a color demo, and I forgot my Indian yellow, so I'm screwed. But I have something similar, so I got an orange, Indian orange yellow, which is going to kind of mess up my demo, but I've got every color of the rainbow button, the one that I always use. And Annie has taken my class, and she knows I love Indian yellow, and I use it for everything, so I had it out last night, and I put it in the box. Um, so I started, uh, I'll do a little talk about my sort of evolution as an artist, and then I'll do a color demo, and then I'll do a painting technique, uh, oil painting technique with a bit of layering and glazing, and so I'm going to do three separate things. Um, so I started out uh, with a kid, my dad had art books, couldn't draw, loved coloring, uh, so I always tell my kids now that I'm going to color, so they all think daddy colors for a living. Um, and uh, when I was in high school, I took art as an easy credit. I did a little sculpting and painting in grade eight, and then I didn't do arts at all. I did uh, chemistry, science, math, and English, French, and, and avoided the arts. And then in grade 12, I thought, I'm gonna take some easy credit classes, because I think that's what you do in grade 12. And I actually took uh, Shakespeare English, keyboarding, uh, art classes, and I just was like in love. I just fell in love. I had no skills. Uh, but I liked all the projects, I liked all the ideas, so art just grabbed and I've been doing art since then, I was 16 I guess at the time, um, so I had a teacher in grade 12 who took me to the art college to do figure drawing, first lady I ever drew was this large breasted black lady, her breasts were bigger than her head, and I was like, <laughs> so, kind of shocked for the first minute, and then it was just the challenge of how do you draw, how do you draw, and I couldn't actually draw, I got into art school without being able to draw, but I liked ideas and I could talk my way through the interview, and uh, in first year of college I did uh, all the basic courses, and in the drawing course the teacher said, I don't know how you got into school, I'll pass you, but you better work your butt off, so I was like, okay, I will work my butt off. I actually wanted to drop out of art school, uh, but they wouldn't give me the tuition back, so I kind of kept going and uh, decided to get serious about learning how to draw. And by the end of our college, I actually won the top drawing award for the fine arts department. So a little bit of work and it paid off. I did four years at the Ontario College of Arts, and then I took a year off, and then I went back to a fifth year of studies in Florence, Italy, and uh, had a studio right in Piazza San Marco, and I was a teacher's assistant, and it was awesome. Like right in the heart of Florence, around the corner was the Academy of the Statue of David, mm -hmm. Uh, we had a drawing class to the Uffizi, we could go into the drawing cabinets, so I copied Bruegel's and uh, the, the Italians are funny, they call uh, anyone who's not Leonardo or Michelangelo second-rate artists. Oh. So, <laughs> so we were allowed to, to do master copies of the second-rate artists. So I got to copy Bruegel, Rubens, you know, all the second-rate artists. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, and my drawing still got pretty good. Uh, I didn't really learn a lot of painting technique in art school. Uh, you would think at the Ontario College of Art you would learn a little more. I feel like I learned how to paint after college. So, so I'm going to share a little bit about what I've figured out through reading, trial and error, and uh, here's practice. Um, so I think the 10,000 hour rule applies to everything, and definitely the drawing and painting. Uh, more than half an hour a week is required. <laughs> People go, oh, you know, I'm kind of an artist, and whatever. So I think you got to dedicate a fixed set of time uh, to anything that you want to improve at. So I did that, and uh, I've been painting pretty much full time, uh, other than a bit of teaching, since I was 26. Uh, when I moved from Toronto, I went to school in Italy, moved back to uh, Toronto, and I started working for my brother, and I thought, what am I doing? I'm an artist. I want to be an artist. So. Uh, my other brother said, why don't you move out to BC, you can live in my basement, uh, just pay for food. So I'm like, okay, this sounds good. So I had a, one brother took care of me for about half a year, free accommodation. Uh, I don't think I ever paid him for food. Uh, and then the other brother who lived in Ladner, one lived in Mission, one lived in Ladner, uh, let me live with him for half a year, and then a house after half a year. Uh, then I moved into an apartment 
that I basically had a bed in the laundry room and uh, my bedroom was my studio and uh, just kept going and going. A lot of artists are told you need portfolios, you need an artist statement, you need uh, you know, credibility somehow, you need a track record of sales, all that kind of stuff to start. I went to a gallery with a few photos of my first paintings I did in BC. Uh, and the, I went up to the dealer on Bradley Street and I said, you want to see my photos? No, 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 they don't look at it. And I said, come on, I'm just... So I flipped open my book and he goes, hmm. So I, flipped, I just flipped these lousy four by six inch photos. And he saw maybe four or five things come upstairs. So my paintings were uh, really romantic. I fell in love with a girl in Italy. And uh, so the first paintings I did were all these sweet romantic things. And I think they were uh, commercially appealing. I had no high prices because I was just starting out. So I would just sell them for whatever the guy wanted. And uh, managed to, over time, get a few shows, get some good sales develop my skill, develop my, my ideas. I moved away from romanticism. Uh, the uh, first time I brought up what I would call a weird painting to the gallery, he's like, oh, it's, it's a good painting, but it'll never sell. He sold within a week, so I went, yay. <laughs> um, so it was kind of fun to realize I didn't have to get stuck in a rut. I just always go with my gut. I always paint where I'm at. I always, uh, I don't really think, oh, is someone gonna like this or not. The paintings that I haven't sold, I've sold a lot of weird ones, and I have a few that are really sweet that haven't sold, uh, and I have a few really weird ones that haven't sold, but overall I just do what I do, and it's never been about the sales per, per se, it's about just following my own gut instinct about what my ideas are going to be. Uh, <coughs> I managed to get into a few galleries, and every gallery I got into was basically that show a few bad pictures kind of thing. Uh, now we have websites, so a lot of artists use websites, and I think you get into galleries if you want to get into a gallery by talking to people. I've had a lot of galleries approach me and then promise me things and then not follow through. So the whole gallery system is a little strange. Uh, they're always trying to figure out, I think, what looks not marketable but is marketable. There's a weird kind of duality of, the, of what they show. So you could do the best landscapes in the world and like, you know, we're not really interested in that. And you could do some really weird, loose stuff and then oh, that's interesting. And they, try it out, but if they don't sell within six months, or don't have a client deal within six months, they usually drop you, so. Um, I think most people paint and have this dream of being a successful artist or a famous artist, and I think the main goal should never be just that. It should be about the work and about getting the work where you want it to be and getting what you want out of it, not about what you're expecting the world to be, your acknowledgement. Uh, it's gotta be about the work, so. Um, the first painting I finished in BC, I put it to the Mission Library, uh, it was called the BC Festival of the Arts, and I got on the cover of the BC Festival of the Arts. And I'd only been here a couple months and I felt so guilty because I'm like, I shouldn't be on there. I'm not really a BC artist yet, I just moved here. But uh, the painting was really sweet and I think they liked it. It wasn't a great painting, I still have it. Uh, I sold it and then I got it back circumstances, so that's still in the cupboard, but uh, I just keep it because it's the first painting I did, and uh, I managed to get it back from somebody that bought it. Um, but it was not a good painting. But anyway, it was on the cover of the BC Festival of the Arts, so I had a nice welcoming into BC. It was kind of the first, when I was, I guess, 25 or 26, that was my first sort of yay moment. The first show I ever had was in a restaurant in uh, Yorkville, in Toronto. It was probably 24. And the lady that hung the show was drawings, uh, they weren't that good. Um, and uh, I had a price, like I'd spent two weeks on something, um, one drawing, and I had a price of $400, so not being a lot of money, the restaurant gets half. <laughs> so, you know, she sold it for $200, because she thought it was great, the person wanted it, $200, and uh, I was so like, you can't, I like, spent two weeks on this thing. She goes, yeah, but it's a sale, it's good, it's good. So from that point on, I've never let anybody undersell my stuff. I've always said, this is the price. You can't dick around with my pricing. I'm not giving my stuff away. I think a lot of artists give stuff away with fundraisers. And if you don't need to make a living at it, I think that's a good thing. But uh, for, for a number of years, I donated like two months worth of my time a year to auction fundraisers for UNICEF and Art for Life and Arts Umbrella and Vancouver Art Gallery and did a lot of donation stuff. Now I sort of, I just donate the odd etching or the odd 
Lido cut or something. I don't have two months of my time to give away anymore. I have kids and that kind of stuff. So, um, anyway, I had uh, pretty much success in Vancouver. And I've tried to branch out a few times. I've had a show in LA uh, with an older dealer and she not looking at work kind of thing. And I have my iPad, thank God for iPads, and I just flipped a couple of pictures. And then she thought she recognized the person that I was with, and that's the only reason she said she'd look at my portfolio. <laughs> she wanted to respect this person, but she thought she recognized it. Anyway, she gave me a solo show. I had a good show up uh, in West Hollywood. Uh, had a lot of trade shows or art fairs to call through the gallery that I was with, a couple of galleries I was with in Vancouver. And, uh, I have lots of sort of private clients now. I do commissions for people the odd time. I have a client list. And from the first show I ever had, I always kept everybody's address, phone number. We didn't have email 25 years ago. Um, but I've always, for years, said to people, I don't even know, I met them once on the bus kind of thing, and I just kept connecting with people. And people actually go, oh, I still love your cards. And I love. So I've always maintained that. I've moved everybody over to the electronic uh, way of communicating, and now you can check who opens your emails. With the, so I got a 43% open rate last month, um, which is pretty good for our industry. Uh, and what else? About four years ago, we went camping. I was frustrated a little bit with my career. The economy was kind of tanking a bit. Uh, and a lot of the shows I had, I sold most of the work. Uh, and most of the work in. I've probably done 400 paintings, and I've sold about 350 of them. So I don't have that much work on my own. Um, yeah, a few of the ones I haven't sold are the weird ones I told you about. Um, so I've done really well, but the economy's been a little slow. Um, so I thought uh, I'm going to try marketing myself. I opened a gallery in Lavender last year, about a year ago. I actually opened my studio for the first time in 25 or 26 years of painting. I never had an open house, never had an open studio until February of this year. And it, I had 400 people show up, so I was with that. that was nice. Um, I think with the internet, now you could actually connect with a lot of people that you couldn't do. Galleries used to have all the clients, all the connection, do all the mailing, uh, take 50%, still make you frame your work, all that kind of stuff. I just thought I'm going to try it. Locally, I haven't been enough following, and I had a lot of collectors that uh, I've been just doing it locally on my own. So it's been pretty fun. I just got a commission from somebody in Richmond this week, yay. And, uh, yeah, just everything's moving along. So, uh, what else? So I'll show a few photos. This is a painting I did. I do. I kind of work. Uh, my ideas kind of come uh, from whatever's going on in my life. So the first show was love. The second show was missing the girl I was going to marry in Italy. You know? <laughs> so the paintings got a little weirder. And then I started following a lot more politics and global issues. And so the work kind of took different directions, a number of pieces I did were to do the shady business. Uh, I had kids, so I did a show called Play, and it was kind of like from the sweet side of play to the more aggressive side of play. And just after that show happened, uh, that show was sold really well. And then 9-11 happened like four months later, so I managed to have good sales just before 9-11, so I was covered for <laughs> about two years of finances. And then uh, I did a show called Power Play, which was a little more commentary on uh, stuff to do with war and power and aggression and that kind of stuff. And, and then I did a series, a whole series. I went to New York for a while, so I was trying to understand money and the art market and that kind of stuff. So I did a show called Bulwarks. Uh, and then I did a mining series. I had a few friends that are mining and investment guys, and so we started talking about ideas, and so a whole show came out of that. Uh, so I just kind of go with the flow of things. Um, and now I actually at a point where I don't really know what to paint. <laughs> which is normal, can't always be on the ball. Uh, so I'm actually painting sweeter imagery. I've painted a few pieces in the past year that are more pleasure-based and more sensory-based. Uh, so just about painting, uh, experiential, uh, sensory stuff. Uh, but you can, if I told you my inner world, and then I talked about my inner world through my history of my paintings, you'd go, oh yeah, that's when you were all fucked up. Like, oh yeah, that's when you were really happy. So I, I can see my whole personal biography sort of veiled in all the work. Uh, and I think that's the most honest work. I think a lot of being uh, vulnerable and uh, truthful to yourself is the way to really find the best work. Uh, for me, that's what's worked. A lot of people go to art school and they come out and they're, 
there's this sort of detached conceptual thing that's happening. And there's a term now called zombie abstraction, which if you look at the RBC, I don't want to criticize RBC, great that they're supporting the arts, but you look at the work of the 15 finalists and I don't know who any of those people are, I don't know any of the issues they face, I don't know any, I don't feel any emotion from the work, it's really just sort of intellectualized, intellectualized work. So I'm a little bit of an anomaly in terms of what's happening currently, but I don't care, I'm just going to do my thing, right? Um, I had a couple of questions. Yeah, questions please. Did you marry your Italian lady? Nope. <laughs> okay, nope. I thought maybe you'd be in Italy if you did. No, yeah. No. No. <laughs> the I other... Like, I like Lander. Lander's <laughs> kind of Dutch and Italian, you know. No, I didn't marry my so I got a lovely wife. I'm happy. The other thing, that, like I was at your website and I noticed, and, and this painting too, a lot of them look like self-portraits. Like, you, are you painting yeah. yourself in uh, a lot of your paintings? I come up with ideas. They're always self-portraits. Um, they're not supposed to be. They're just a generic person, and then they end up taking my nose or my ears or bad hair one day, and then it's on the painting. Or, uh, so I actually draw ideas. I like to show you how I start an idea. Uh, my sketchbooks basically are non-existent. I do post-it notes and words. <laughs> and then I'll pull out a pile of newsprint and just start playing with charcoal. So I have like a painting that's four by six feet hanging in my living room, and the idea was done while I was on the phone on a post-it note. So my idea started up, I call it chicken scratch. It was kind of roughing out. So all I'm doing is try to get the idea down and the approximation of the composition, that's it. I don't actually do a lot of sustained drawings. Uh, I'll show you a couple of sketches. See, the more I talk, the more I don't have to show you that I don't have my Indian yellow. <laughs> <laughs> I did the wrong pass and I didn't change that. Oh, well, that's the thing. So you're my head. banking one. No. Uh, but your head is blocking what yeah, you're looking at anyway, so we really can't. We really can't see. So, so my idea is like I'll be sitting on the bus, and I did this on the bus just coming home from. Uh, that turned into a painting. It's just, just the idea of the whole idea of conceptual art. Yeah, I'll put it down. So I was thinking a lot about conceptual art and how everything's about placement and that. So I was thinking everybody does things differently. So I started playing with these figures and cubes and uh, so that's just a quick sketch I did on the bus. Uh, this so this is, is where you need to Yeah. Stand back, right? <laughs> Hang on. So this painting started out just as a, a doodle, really fast on a piece of newsprint. That's my drawing. It's no, no detail. Can you see that? Yeah. yeah. So that sketch is black charcoal. It's probably about that big. It's just, I, I actually sometimes sit for a week at a time and just draw ideas out. And I don't actually have a plan on how to draw six old paintings. And I just start drawing and let it kind of come. And I sometimes look at my little word notes, like Wall Street, cleaning up Wall Street. So that's cleaning up Wall Street. It's basically taking the bowl to the bath. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to do a bubble bath. I thought, okay, what kind of bowl would it be if you had a bath? There's always the, the bowl representing the bowl markets. And so I did this sort of sly, kind of going along with the gag kind of bowl, getting a bath done. So that, just sitting there drawing doodly. Uh, I'll show you a few more. So this is, uh, I like the idea, I was thinking about sort of when, there was a saying called, uh, or thought that all nature is sexual, but everyone doesn't want to talk about sex. So I was thinking about how women love to cut flowers and how they're kind of sticking the, <laughs> the fertility, even though it's like, oh, it's a nice vacation. So I did this little drawing, just like this is a bad sketch, thinking about what the lady would do, went to the next side of the page. I don't actually even try and place on the page until I have a solid idea with the composition. It's just getting out ideas. I went from this doodle to, uh, I go right to the canvas and I start drawing on a canvas. So this is uh, fine charcoal on a canvas, which is how I start all my paintings. Uh, and I just, with fine charcoal, the beauty of fine charcoal is you can draw 
on the canvas and you wipe it off and it just leaves a faint ghost. If you're using really good Belgian linen, you, you can draw on it, I'll show you. I don't always paint from photos, this is done from a photo, but you can draw on a canvas and then you can take a cloth and wipe it off and all you get is a faint ghost. So I can actually draw, wipe off, draw, I'll leave something if I like it and then once I like all my vine charcoal, I'll go in with a, with a, I can reshape stuff, move things around, wind it, whatever. Then I, if I like what's there, I don't like that one, but if I like what's there, I'll go with a, with a hard charcoal pencil and I'll just press on the drawing parts I like. So I give myself a lot of freedom. I'm not bound by the drawing. I'm, I can change things all the way through a painting. I don't often, I usually like to have my drawing figured out before I put any paint on the canvas. But when you wipe off the vine charcoal, once you draw with the uh, harder charcoal, it leaves your line. So that's how I established my drawing. So that's what I did here. This is from a photo, but then I'm kind of playing around with things and moving things around. And then once I like it, draw with the charcoal, wipe it all off, look at it. If I like all my shapes or placements, I can then erase if I need to. Uh, once I have that, then I go in with the uh, brown umber and mineral spirits and I just line everything or I wash in things. Last night I was drawing that area up at the top of the canvas and I didn't like the shape of it. I decided to get, instead of a full body suit, I decided I was going to get the belly there and just have fun with it, reshape the pants. At one point the pants were way out here with the charcoal and I kept slimming it up, slimming, slimming it up and I thought if it was a younger lady painting she would probably have more of a handsome physique guy than a frumpy guy, so I kind of was playing sort of like a devilish, sexy, I don't know what, but se sexual character, and then she's just painting this warrior lady, and I'm just kind of letting it happen. Uh, the, the main figure's done from that, from the photo. And I never used to project, I used to square up everything and draw it out grid by grid, and I just started using a projector in the past couple of years, it makes everything really fast. Even with, uh, even with this full uh, drawing, uh, maybe. even with the bubble bath full drawing, which is going on. I actually liked my thumbnail enough to just project that, and then I do the fine charcoal on the canvas, and then I, instead of drawing it all on paper, getting it perfect, and then transferring it, I just transfer my initial shapes and then I reshape everything, play with gesture, play with angles, wide and narrow, adjust. Sometimes I'll move the whole thing over, but... Uh, so yeah, with that one, with that one I just trace these shapes on the canvas, and then I figured out the background. And I, I was gonna bring this painting today, but I didn't. I, I, most of my paintings are bigger than these two that are here today. They're usually four feet, uh, 44 by 48 inches, kind of my favorite size because you can turn it around and it's easy to handle anything a little bigger and you're struggling anything too small. I feel like I'm sort of stuck in a smaller area. So I really like this size canvas uh, and it actually fits well in people's homes, I think. A lot of people say, oh, your paintings are too big. I'm like, well, no, your furniture's too big. <laughs> <laughs> you stretch your own? Yeah. I stretch my own canvas. Um, I used to paint on acrylic fine uh, canvas, the stuff you get at the art store, or I would buy ready mates, uh, but I didn't like the way the paint grabbed the surface. Belgian linen is so nice to paint on, it's kind of a natural weave, it's not like a systematic bump. I don't feel like I'm painting on band-aid gauze. Uh, and you can get different textures, so if you want to do more scumbling textures where you drag paint across the surface, it grabs nicely. If you want a smoother portrait linen for more refined work where there's lots of blending, you can get a finer uh, weave linen. So it's pretty expensive, but it's so nice to paint on. I love it. Um, so I'll just show you. So that was the snipper snapper lady. That was the, the sketch. Am I talking long enough? Yeah. Uh, and then f that was drawn on the canvas. And uh, I, I was just drawing it up, and I thought it'd be fun to have owls kind of smartly hiding in the dark away from the lady with the scissors. This hand is huge. And this hand is more like a little claw. And I just drew it out and I thought, yeah, maybe there's something to that. You know, there's a little bit of a psychological uh, twist to that distortion. And so I try and make the shapes work and see what I can do with it. I don't always, I say, I always say I'm not bound by realism. A lot of people are bound by realism. It has to look exact. I find the more freedom I give myself, 
more uh, open the idea, people can read into it. If it's too literal, then it's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't have a, a sort of an enigmatic kind of, what's he thinking about kind of thing. So I actually like playing with distortion. It gives me a lot of, but it makes me more interested in the paintings I'm doing too, as opposed to just doing a direct copy of something. So. When you do a sketch, yeah. <laughs> I have a problem with this. When I'm out sketching, like I can draw a little box and, and it's just this fabulous little sketch yeah. and I go and transfer it to a canvas, it's different proportions yeah. and it drives me crazy because it just doesn't work. So do you, are your little sketches in proportion to your the, canvas? The, yeah. Yeah. Often. You start yeah. Sometimes properly, I think yeah. that it's, once you enlarge it, you might go, ooh, that hand looks like really big or, you know, that head looks like a monster head on a little tiny body or puppety or something, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and if it doesn't, then because I have that vine charcoal, I have the freedom to change things right on the canvas. So if you're stuck, the good thing to do is have something that you're, you're not uh, committed to at the beginning of the painting stage. That's why it's good to get your drawing resolved before you get to paint. A lot of people are into paint committed, and then they go, ooh, that barn looks like a mansion, or that you know, tree looks gigantic compared to that. Well, you, you can adjust a lot if you're not committed with your material. So that's why I love the uh, burnt twigs, vine charcoal. Um, so that's first stage. I refine the drawing, do what I did here. I wipe off, I go around and line in what I like. Then I start putting in uh, uh, brown umber, or sometimes ultra. The reason I use umber is because it dries the fastest. Uh, is that, is that the or uh, Burnt umber, raw umber. umber. A lot of the browns dry really quickly. And uh, sometimes I'll add a little bit of white or a little bit of blue to make it blacker. If you mix ultramarine blue and, and uh, uh, any of your browns, usually it goes to a really nice dark color. You can have a warm black or you can have a cool black. And they dry really fast. And so I can actually start painting within a day or so over top of my line drawing. Sometimes I'll paint right into 